At dawn, 150 years ago, an army of British, French and Turkish soldiers landed on Russia's southern shore. By 12 o'clock, that barren and desolate beach, inhabited by wildfowl only a short time before, was swarming with life. We are an army of occupation at last. Soon that desolate terrain would be teeming with corpses. A million soldiers and civilians dead by the end of the war. Today we count 160 dead of the 600 men of our regiment who landed a month ago. Our splendid band is quite silenced. The big drummer has been killed by a round shot. The first clarinet is dead of cholera and the poor child who played the cymbals has lost a leg. Fifty years later, one of Russia's first filmmakers put these old survivors on parade once more. Russian, British and French veterans of the Crimean War stared uncertainly into the 20th century. They'd fought in a war which straddles the frontier between myth and the modern world. These are the men who fought at Inkerman, Alma and Balaclava. These are the men who charged into the valley of death and into the legends of war. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon in front of them, volleyed and thundered. Stormed out with shot and shell, boldly they rode and well, into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell, rode the six hundred. But on the front line where the poets didn't go were the first war photographers and war correspondents. This story of the Crimean War is told by the diaries and letters, the paintings and photographs of those who were actually there. The accounts they left make this war unique. What ignited the war was the decay of the mighty Ottoman Empire, which had carried Islamic rule into the heart of Europe. To the north, Imperial Russia waited like a vulture, eyeing its prey. In January 1853, the British ambassador visited the Tsar in St. Petersburg to discover his intentions towards Turkey. The Tsar's reply sounded like an invitation to conspire. We have a sick man on our hands a man who is seriously ill. The sick man is dying. We must come to some understanding. But Tsar Nicholas did not come to an understanding with the British. Nine months later, Russian troops crossed the Danube into Turkey's European provinces. The Tsar's pretext was the protection of Orthodox Christians living under Islamic rule. His gamble was that no Christian power would ever fight to protect a Muslim state. France and Britain suspected the real Russian target was Constantinople. The city commanded the strategic gateway from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. If Russia seized control, her warships would have access to the open seas all the year round.
Finally, in November 1853, a confrontation at Sinop on the southern shore of the Black Sea propelled Britain and France towards war. A Russian fleet spotted a Turkish squadron sheltering in port from bad weather. The Russian Admiral Nakhimov launched an attack using a devastating new weapon, explosive shells. In an hour and a half, the action was decided. And if Admiral Nakhimov had ceased his fire, there would have been no stain on his credit. But he kept up a merciless fire of shot and shell, which killed numbers of unresisting men. He did not cease firing till every Turkish ship save one was a stranded wreck. Adolphus Slade. Admiral Slade was a British officer serving with the Ottoman Navy. His report of the massacre was rushed back to London. We found above a hundred wounded in every stage of suffering, some in agony, many of them disfigured by explosions. The exploding shells at Sinop sent a warning to all the wooden warships of Europe. It was a victory which Britain, the leading naval power, could not ignore. It is a major triumph for the Russians who destroy the Ottoman fleet at virtually no loss to themselves. In political terms, it isn't so much of a triumph because it plays into the hands of the war party, particularly in London, and it does bring the British and the French fleets into the Black Sea. The Russian warships had sailed from Sebastopol, headquarters of Russia's Black Sea fleet. From this moment, Britain's naval chiefs started to make plans for attacking Sebastopol and destroying Russia's naval power. For the British, sign-up was a national humiliation. Britannia's rule over the waves had been called into question by the Russians, the Turkish fleet had been destroyed, and the popular press termed it a massacre. In France, too, the call to war was sounded. Earlier that year, Napoleon III had proclaimed himself emperor. His ambition was to match the military glory of his uncle, Napoleon Bonaparte. The British commander-in-chief was Lord Raglan. His right arm had been shot away at the Battle of Waterloo, and he still referred to France as the enemy. The French and British now buried centuries of rivalry and formed an alliance. In March 1854, they declared war on Russia. From Glasgow, Birmingham and Norwich, young men were in a hurry to enlist and see some action. Timothy Gowing was one of the first. I was fast approaching my 20th year, a dangerous age to many, and thrilling accounts of war in the newspapers worked me up to try my luck. In marching out of the barracks at Manchester, we could have walked over the heads of the people who were wrought up to such a pitch of excitement as almost amounted to madness. Cheer, boys, cheer, no more a final song. And then the band struck up, Cheer, Boys, Cheer, which seemed to have a thrilling effect on the multitude and gave fresh animation to the men. The British army headed for Constantinople to join their French and Turkish allies. This was the city they had come to defend, the crumbling capital of Turkey's Islamic Empire.